Hello, everybody. Welcome to Marriage and Kinship. This is our very first lecture about David Schneider's readings. And also, it is our very first chance to talk about what this thing called kinship might be. So, to start with, I want to give you a very brief definition of kinship. This is my own very brief definition of kinship. But basically, it is a way or multiple ways of determining who is important to us or who is connected to us, otherwise known as our family. There are three questions that we will be dealing with to start. The first is, what is it exactly that connects people? Is it social or is it pre-social? By pre-social, I mean something biological, like perhaps genetics, perhaps some idea of shared blood or shared bone or shared flesh, perhaps the idea that you came from somebody's womb, someone's uterus, and this connects you. That would be something that's pre-social, right? Something that is social would be something like recognition of a child to say not only have I given birth to this child, not only did my partner give birth to this child, but we accept this child into our family. Um, I also want to discuss how we can talk about kinship in a way that gets at actual relationships without making assumptions based on our own cultures. Kinship is a difficult subject. It's a sensitive subject because it involves trying to understand the relationships that are in a lot of ways the most important to people. And it's very easy for people to get offended when you start saying things like, you know, I know you love your parents, but that relationship isn't natural. <laughs> um, it's it's really, really hard also to not try and bring in our own baggage about modern science or genetics, um, the things that we often believe make us related to each other, because kinship is weirder than that. This is just going to be a refrain throughout the semester. Kinship is weirder than that. Then finally, I want to ask, is kinship fundamentally different to or more important than other kinds of human groups or relationships? Is it more important than friendship? Is it more important than being a coworker or a comrade? So before we can answer these questions, we need to have some helpful terms. There will be a lot of definitions in this class, and I apologize for that in advance. One term is consanguinity, which is basically fake Latin for sharing blood. We might also think of consanguinity as relationships determined by genetics. We also talk about descent, usually in terms of thinking about a descent group. For example, a group of people who all trace their family trees back to a common ancestor. In Kazakhstan, if you think about your Jatiata, then the seventh grandfather, everybody who shares that seventh grandfather at the top of the family tree is going to be part of the same descent group. Okay, having defined these terms, let's move on to a question. <laughs> What is the relationship between human biology and reproduction and systems of relationships as we understand them culturally? One answer comes from the 19th century anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan, who says the family relationships are as ancient as the family. They exist in virtue of the law of derivation, which is expressed by the perpetuation of the species through the marriage relation. Basically, people get married, they have sex, they have babies, that's the family. It's obvious. Of course, if you think about this for more than half a second, 
it's pretty obvious that it's not all down to biology. However, early students of kinship treated biology as the model that more purely cultural forms follow. So maybe you've heard the term fictive kinship. Fictive kinship is that the idea that you can have um, somebody who you treat as a sibling or a parent, and while you might not actually be biologically related, you have modeled your relationship on that biological relationship. A lot of you probably have an aunt or an uncle who is a friend of one of your parents and you're not actually biologically related to them. Maybe you've never thought about it too much. Um, I definitely have a fictive aunt who is way more attentive to my Instagram and my social media than the aunt that I'm actually biologically related to. So um, even though, however, this is a social phenomenon, it is something that is treated as modeled on a biological phenomenon that is the paradigm of kinship. However, this isn't the only possible answer. Another answer is that kinship is totally sociological. For example, if we consider the decision to recognize or illegitimize <laughs> or adopt children, or to give them up, right? Um, if you bear a child that you give up for adoption, you are saying, I have just dated this child, and I have given birth to this child, but this is not my child. I release this child to be taken by other parents. Basically, the existence of a biological relationship in this model doesn't determine the existence of a sociological relationship. If we assume that biology comes first, then we assume that all people who have a biological relationship to each other have a sociological relationship to each other. And also some people who don't have a biological relationship have a kinship-like relationship modeled on the biological version. In this version, kinship is totally sociological. Paraphrasing founding sociologist Emile Durkheim, Schneider says, even birth alone is not adequate to make the child an integral member of the group. Religious ceremonies or some kind of social formality must be added. The idea of consanguinity, right, of sharing blood or genetics is thus secondary and as a result of this, the organization of kinship expresses something very different from genealogical or consanguineal relations. So, concludes Durkheim, all kinship is social, for it consists essentially in jural and moral relations sanctioned by society. It is a social tie, or it is nothing. In addition to the difficulty of deciding whether biology or sociology is more fundamental to the way we organize our families, we also have to consider that there is a problem of language that happens when we use English as our language of science. Because whatever the equivalence of father or mother or parent might mean in other languages, these words in English have very strong consanguineous associations for native English speakers. And so as long as we're using English as the language of research, we are basically still defining kinship with reference to biology. One thing that we could potentially do is we could try to invent new terms that wouldn't have this sort of cultural baggage. So Schneider suggests terms like genetic father or genetic mother, which would be the person who contributes a sperm cell or an egg cell, versus a genitor or genitrix who contributes something physical to the creation of a child, but that isn't necessarily genetic material. So for example, a genetic mother could donate an egg cell and a genetrix could gestate 
the child in her or their uterus. And then we have these terms pater and mater, which designate social roles of fatherhood and motherhood. These terms allow us to separate out three things, modern genetic understandings of relatedness versus folk beliefs or local theories, such as ideas about being connected by blood, right? That's not actually how we're connected in science, but it's something that we say a lot, um, versus the social roles that people actually perform. However, it turns out that it's much easier to make these distinctions in theory than in practice. It turns out to be really hard to completely untangle biology and sociology for reasons that we'll discuss later in the semester when we talk about assisted reproduction and international adoption. It turns out that biological acts, even if it's donating sperm, have emotional consequences that we can't just ignore. Another question that we can ask is whether kinship is a privileged system of social organization. And by privileged, I mean, is kinship somehow more important than or prior to more basic than other forms of social organization? In order to investigate this, Schneider looks at this proverb, which is that blood is thicker than water. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but you hear it often enough in English. Blood is thicker than water basically expresses the idea that genetic relationships naturally lead to particular kinds of reliable, emotional, and social relationships. But do they? One answer that Schneider gives is that kinship is basically a state of being, not of doing or performance. So if you are biologically related to somebody, you are biologically related to somebody. That's it. You're related. There's no debate about it. And so the performance of kinship, Schneider says, is presumed to follow automatically if the bond exists. So we can ask, are kinship bonds something that just exists or something that we actually have to work to make. However, this isn't the only possible answer. Schneider also says that there is an obvious problem with the view that the bonds of kinship are innate or instinctual, which is that people have different systems and different understandings of kinship. People have arguments about kinship. People have lawsuits about kinship. So Schneider says, in a phrase that I think is really beautiful, if they are innate, why did they not show themselves automatically? And if they are as self-evident as the color of the sky, why were they not automatically noted and immediately converted into those ideas of kinship, which constitute what Morgan called a system of consanguinity? If kinship is obvious, why is it actually different everywhere. Schneider also attempts to give us a synthesis of these two answers. This synthesis says basically that European social scientists, European anthropologists took European common sense about kinship, this idea that blood is thicker than water, and just turned it into scientific terminology like consanguineous, sharing blood, without really theoretically evaluating it, without seeing if it really worked in terms of describing other societies. So, in conclusion, because North American and European anthropologists themselves had this belief that blood was thicker than water, they treated blood, genetics, as the building blocks of all other forms of social organization. And so we can safely say that kinship is important in European societies and within the history of anthropology as a discipline. But we don't actually know how much it matters elsewhere. Hopefully, throughout this semester, 
We'll find out. Thank you for listening and I'll virtually see you next time.